Okay, here we are. I uh, have, if you're following this series, I have um, been using a USB flash drive to run shell scripts on my new, uh, well, it's new to me, 2016 Mazda 3. Uh, and uh, I wrote a script that dumped a bunch of uh, information to a USB flash drive. And so uh, now we're going to have a quick look at what information I grabbed. So I'm in the folder. This is my USB flash drive. I'm going to list out. You can see I named each file Mazda dot whatever information is in there. So let's go ahead and start off. We'll just cat out uh, Mazda BusyBox. So this is just the output of BusyBox, which lists every application it built into that BusyBox. And as you can see, it's a fairly full uh, copy of BusyBox. Now it's a 2016. Uh, Mazda 3 and as you can see this compilation of um, BusyBox is from 2015 so that was relatively new when the car was built uh, which is great and you know BusyBox if you're not familiar with it is a single binary file that contains a number of tools all your core tools and actually more than that um, and it's on pretty much every ARM device you have. Your TV uh, probably has it, even if it's not a smart TV, like my Samsung, which is an older Samsung TV, and still has uh, you know some capabilities of playing videos off USB drive. Uh, it has BusyBox on it. Your Android phone is either going to have BusyBox or ToyBox. ToyBox is kind of like a remake of BusyBox under a different license. Um, BusyBox has been around longer and has more tools. Uh, although when you compile it, you can decide what tools are in there. And a lot of systems, especially if you have a router, uh, BusyBox is most definitely going to be on your router, uh, but it might be a slim down to save space. I mean, BusyBox in general is usually around one megabyte, one and a half megabytes, even when it has all the tools in it. But if you're on a system that only has 16 megabytes of space, you want to you know save as much as possible. But there's so many tools on here, and it makes me so happy. And again. I mean, I have access to this. I can copy a new copy of BusyBox over there with any tools that I'm missing. Has many of the tools that I, you know, obviously it's got to have things like uh, it's going to have a shell. Usually, it's the uh, Ash shell, shell. Shell. You're going to have uh, Awk and Cat and Grep, wherever that is. Grep, Grep, alphabetical order. There you go. You know, it's got uh, Wget here at the end. A uh, lot of tools. One of the things that's commonly missing from BusyBox on lightweight systems, they will remove uh, the HTTPD, which is a web server. And that They have that in there, which is awesome. Uh, they uh, have Chirrut. So let me go back up to the C's here. Uh, we have Chirrut, which is awesome, because that means uh, that once I do pop a shell that I can interact with, I can Chirrut into Debian, which would be awesome to have Debian running on my car, just to say that I have Debian running on my car, if nothing more. Um, you know, but you have all these tools. I mean, pretty much everything you need. Uh, two things that are normally uh, in a full BusyBox install, uh, actually two and a half things, uh, that are not on here. So if I was to grep this out, just to double check, uh, usually there's a Telnet server and a Telnet client, and there's not in here. And usually there's an FTP server and an FTP client, and there's not. Now, I don't care too much about the FTP server because I have a USB drive I can plug into, and as you'll see in a moment, there's also SSH in there. Uh, so the Telnet really isn't necessary, but if I wanted to use uh, a Telnet-like thing, you know, uh, there is Netcat in there. And so I could create a shell and access that way if for some reason SSH wasn't on there and there's no telnet, I could use this to get a shell. Uh, so let's go ahead and continue to look at our files here. So as you saw, a lot of core tools in there. Uh, uh, DF, you can see here a quick sum of the size of the partitions that are used and how much of them are used. Uh, the SDA1 here is my flash drive, which was a two gig flash drive, just a cheap little flash drive. But you can see that uh, there's uh, some uh, devices here and there's there's over four gigs worth of of storage built into the head unit already. But again, there's an SD card slot and two USB ports, so I can add whatever storage I want to it. Uh, what I did find interesting, so normally you'll find you know block devices like these on uh, embedded devices, ARM devices like this. I've never really seen a partition or a drive named something like this. It's, it's uh, uh, FFX, it's like it's a uh, hex code, uh, but that's interesting. But that's that's the uh, the root first partition on that. It seems to be the root directory, the root uh, file system, which is interesting. We also have here, uh, you know, a data partition and also a data persistence, which I'm curious what's in that, and we'll look in a moment what's in there. But uh, let's keep on uh, going down the line. We'll cat Mazda three. Oh, and the help dialog. Okay, so we'll put that out. So. 
the system, the interface on the uh, the uh, console in my car uh, is uh, created by a company called Johnson Controls. And there's a lot of the tools I have seen on this uh, called JCI, which I assume is Johnson Control Interface. And one of the things when I was running the script, if you watched the previous videos, I had dialogues pop up, and that was using this JCI dialogue. And I dumped out the help uh, screen for that so you can see the options on here. Now, if you're not familiar, uh, there's a lot of tools on, on uh, standard Linux installs uh, or systems that you can install such as Zenity is a popular one or xDialog uh, and there's one or two others that allow you to create simple dialog boxes and that's exactly what this is for for the cars. You can create an info box, a warning box, an error box, a question box or a confirmation box or a box where a lot of those will have an OK button or a cancel button or both. You can also do a box with three options. Um, so these are the types of uh, dialog boxes you put out and all they really do is change the look of the box. Uh, and to give you an example, as I mentioned, Zenity, let me go back here through my history, Zenity. So Zenity, uh, basically, so on my local machine here, Zenity, I say that it's an info box and I give it the text and this is the text that I'm going to give it. If I hit enter, it creates a little information box. And you can see it has a little, you know, uh, glass uh, light bulb there and the text that I put in. Uh, running the same command, but instead of info, if I do question, you can see that it changed the look of it. It says question. It gives you a uh, little question mark there and get yes or no rather than just OK. Uh, and then you can also do uh, an error box. So again, it's the same command. It's just changing the look of the box and the way the buttons are set up. And that's basically what this does. And it's built in to the car already, which is awesome. So you choose what type of box you want. Uh, you choose a title string that shows up at the top of the box, the text in the box, and then the label of the button. So you have an OK button and a cancel button, but you can decide instead of just saying OK or cancel, you can tell it to say something else. And of course, if you have a three button dialog, you can tell what the third button is too. Uh, and of course, you can add, grab the uh, exit code of the command. Uh, it'd be 0, 1, or 2, or 3. I would as, uh, so, sorry, 0, 1, or 2, uh, depending on what button you click. And of course, so you know what button was clicked, so you can continue in your script accordingly. I uh, hope that makes sense. Uh, I mean, if you've played around with one of these dialog boxes, such as Entity or X Dialog, or even Dialog in the Shell, uh, that should make sense to you. If not, it's not important right now. Let's cat out Mazda.du. Uh, so this is, um, I just dumped out uh, basically here just to see, I was trying to see. Uh, how many gigs are being used, but we already looked at some of that information there. Now, here's a, a big file, uh, Mazda3.fs. This is just a list of all the files on the system. Uh, so I can quickly grab through that and I can say true, which you already saw was in BusyBox, but you can see right here it's in the SBIN folder as well, the, the USR. Uh, Unix system resource file, uh, SBIN, true, which is probably, I didn't uh, output, uh, you know, uh, details of this, but it's probably linked, linked to BusyBox. But again, because this is there, I should be able to get Debian running on my car, which is awesome. Other things we can look for, SSH, you can see that there's uh, SSH configs and keys, and you can see that there's a server and a client and a key generator, so SSH is definitely an option on here once I get the Wi-Fi working, um, which uh, it, the if we go next, we can go to IP here, and you can see that there is a Wi-Fi device, and I still need to uh, get that working, but it is there, I just need to get up and running, and actually if I run uh, through the file system again and grep Wi-Fi, you will see uh, that if I go up a little bit here, again in the JCI, which is the Johnson Control Interface, there are some scripts such as Start Wi-Fi or JCI Wi-Fi API, uh, or there's also scripts the same name in another folder. I'm assuming there might just be separate copies of it. And then there's a WPA Wi-Fi. Uh, so there's a lot of, and then, and then down here, a bunch of uh, drivers modules for the system uh, for Wi-Fi is what those look like there to me. So, um, so yeah, there is Wi-Fi. And there are scripts, I need to pull those scripts and look at them a little bit, play around with them, see how they're supposed to load instead of trying to do my own thing first. I want to see what those scripts are doing. Uh, so next, uh, we will do the kernel information. As you can see here, uh, it is 
it was built in 2015 again it's 2016 car so that makes sense it's a obviously a Linux kernel and uh, Linux 3.0.35 so you know pretty new for the time if I remember correctly thinking back uh, and then uh, you can see here it's an ARM version 7 which is awesome because again I do plan on trying to get Debian running on the system which should be easy to do once I pop a shell um, but I need to make sure I have a compilation of Linux uh, for the proper processor. Of course, Debian has builds for many different processor types. ARM, uh, it has a few different ARM, ARM 6, and of course, ARM 7. And uh, I have videos I've done in the past on uh, creating ARM file systems for devices like this, for doing true root in different ways, either using a virtual machine to, uh, to create an image or using uh, the bootstrap. Uh, to to generate uh, to pull down from the internet the ARM file system, but at the same time, pretty sure ARM version seven is uh, I could be wrong. What um, uh, Raspberry Pis use, and if so, uh, that would save me hassle because I have a couple of Raspberry Pis. I should be able to just pull out one of those SD cards, pop it in my car, and churn root right into that uh, you know that partition uh, instead of creating my own you know. Thing, sure that again I have to make sure it's ARM 7 but I'm pretty sure that will work and if not again I know how to create my own uh, file systems like that uh, so again let's move on Mazda partitions and this is just we've already looked at the partition information this is a little more uh, you know just a more detailed look at the different partitions uh, but nothing really there too interesting again this is FAT32 is my SD or uh, not my SD card, my USB flash drive that we're reading stuff off of right now. Uh, I can cut out the password file, which has the password hashes in it. I'm not too worried about someone breaking into my car and getting these. It's probably the same on everyone. And then, of course, uh, I also have a file called user, which we already know that the script was running as root. So pretty cool. A lot of information on there. You know, the most uh, useful thing in here is I think the file system just a list of all the files so I can go through here, I can grep through here and just get an idea of what programs are already on there like um, top, oh sorry, grep top, well, a lot of files called top, but you can see there is uh, a top file and then a top, I'm not sure what a top is, um, what about h top, is there h top, nope, no h top, uh, so yeah, learning more and more about this system uh, I've yet to to get a shell that I can type at. Uh, I have a USB flash drive that I can run scripts off of, uh, but I need an interactive shell to really get into depth. But uh, as we can see, SSH on there, there is a Wi-Fi, uh, and I've run online that you can also get uh, ADB uh, running on it, and then SSH in through that. Which if you have ADB, I don't know why you wouldn't just use a shell, but going in through USB rather than Wi-Fi. Uh, but if it has Wi-Fi, that makes it even simpler. I can connect to it from my phone or have it connect to my network and connect to it through my desktop. Anyway, I hope you are enjoying these videos on um, hacking the Mazda 3 interface. Uh, I am very excited about this and I hope that you keep on watching as I learn more. And I hope you visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris with a K. There's a link in the description of this video. Uh, there you can search through all my videos from this channel and my second channel. And as always, I hope that you have a great day.